The Miriam Institute Podcast with Benjamin Anthony. Israel's future in Israel's hands. Uh, thank you so very much for being here on this webinar of the Miriam Institute. We're back after a very brief hiatus and we're delighted to be back. And as co-founder of the Miriam Institute, I want to begin as ever I do by acknowledging and thanking Rosita Panini, my co-founder at the Institute for all that she does and all the work that she does to make our endeavors possible and successful and impactful. I also want to take a moment to thank my colleague, our colleague in common, Mr. Alan Langer. Alan, thank you so very much for bringing this about. And before I introduce our speaker, who's going to talk to us about the situation in Iran, I wanted to let all of you know that whether you're listening live or whether you're listening on a postcast or seeing this on TV or a podcast, we thank you. And we appreciate you giving your time and your attention to a subject that warrants that time and attention. And what could be more important than Iran's nuclear program and Israel's response to that. Well, to discuss that with me, I have the great pleasure from a different studio than the one that I normally record in, of interviewing Lieutenant Colonel Yochai Gwiski. And I'm just going to read you his bio so that all of you know who this individual is and the credentials that he brings to the table. So Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Yochai Gwiski is a 23 year veteran of the Israel Defense Forces. He retired in 2020 as a Lieutenant Colonel after serving in the Israeli military intelligence. Yochai served in various roles, include, including coordination of government activities in the territories. That is a department, a unit that often goes by the acronym COGAT. You may have heard of COGAT. He also served in the Strategic Planning Division and the Ministry of Defense Politico Military Directorate. He's an expert in international affairs, the Middle East, and national security, with hands-on experience in devising and executing strategic planning at the highest levels of Israeli decision-making. After his retirement from the Israel Defense Forces, he has published several articles relating to the U.S.-Israel and U.S.-Russia relations. Yochai holds a master's degree in international relations with a focus on security studies from Tel Aviv University, and he holds a bachelor's degree in economics and management from Tel Aviv University as well. And we're delighted to have you here, Yochai, just so that everybody knows, I believe in being honest with the people who are kind enough to give of their time. I am going to be looking at the subject on my iPhone, which I have here at this makeshift studio. So if you see me look away from the screen from time to time, it's because I want to keep the conversation rolling as, uh, in as focused a manner as I possibly can. Uh, but this is a subject very close to my heart and to the hearts of everybody who's on this call. And I'd like to begin by just asking you a question. A couple of weeks ago, you actually sat for us on behalf of the Miriam Institute for a roundtable discussion with members of the Ministry of Defense in the United Kingdom on this very subject. So as the interviewee, in that particular case, what did you take in terms of the assessments and understanding of the members of the Ministry of Defence over in the UK? What were your thoughts and impressions on the back of that conversation? How urgent did they see the threat? How able are they to step into Israel's shoes? How understanding are they of Israel's perspective on this unique issue? Um. It was a short stint. Uh, I was just a part of a panel, but uh, is, they were really interested in what is going to happen if if something goes uh, south in, in, in the diplomatic channel. Uh, what what could happen? What would happen uh, if Israel decides uh, to do something about it? So they were looking at contingencies of failure of the diplomatic channel with Iran. So that, that is my take. So th they're looking really... Uh, into that uh, planning or that uh, eventuality uh, instead of um, a successful uh, diplomatic resolution uh, uh, to the negotiations. So do you feel that they are, so they were looking at the possibility of a failure of, of diplomatic endeavors, but do you feel that they are a potent force in that field? I mean, the United Kingdom, of course, is one of the P5 plus one 
do you think that they're out of ideas by looking at the potentiality of a failure? Does that mean that they're resolved to the fact that diplomacy will not succeed, in your opinion? I, I'm, I'm not sure that I can comment very well on, on how much Britain has the power or the capability to do something. But I think that what they were, what they fear, what they thought is that someone else might do something that may get them into a problem or may get the region into a problem. So I think they looked at Israel because Israel is an active player. So they wanted to know what will shape the environment before they take, uh, take a decision or take action with regards to Iran or the US or, or, or whatever. Uh, I believe that they're, they're, they're just trying to understand what is, what's going on. Uh, like most of uh, what we're looking at with Russia and the Ukraine right now, most of us are watching and, and trying to understand what's going on. And we can't influence that uh, in uh, very, very much. So let's, let's take a step back. Before I do, just to give everybody an idea of the timing here, this interview will run for between 60 and 75 minutes. If anybody's got any questions that they want to ask, you can put them into the chat box or into the comment section or raise a hand. If not, I'm going to continue. There's, there's certainly more than 60 minutes of questions that I want to ask you, Yochai, on this subject. So let's begin with a step back, as I mentioned. The reality of the matter is that the State of Israel has made it very, very clear and very, very apparent that it is unwilling to accept not just Iran with nuclear capabilities, but the introduction of nuclear capabilities into the Middle East writ large. We know this because history shows as in 1981, Israel under the leadership of Menachem Begin detonated the Osirak reactor in Iraq. And again in 2007, Israel under the leadership of Prime Minister Ehud Olmelt detonated the Syrian nuclear reactor. Now, what's very interesting about both of those detonations, both of those operations, is that there was very little public, if any, public discourse prior to the successful military raid undertaken by the State of Israel. Uh, in fact, in 1981, as I understand it, there was simply a cable from then US ambassador to Israel informing President Ronald Reagan that the Israelis had undertaken this strike without asking permission or involving the Americans. And in 2007, there was a prelude to the strike. Ehud Olmert did visit Washington, D.C., spoke to George W. Bush. George W. Bush said he preferred a diplomatic route, particularly through the United Nations. Ehud Olmert said he didn't have any faith in that and Israel will do what it needs to do. And only after the strike did Ehud Olmert contact George W. Bush and say something that was there is no longer there and has been destroyed completely without being too specific. So with all of that having been said, how did we come to this place where Israel seems to want to see a military strike against Iran, Iran, Iran's nuclear capabilities and seems also more than willing to, frankly, endlessly talk about that potentiality instead of acting with a conclusive outcome militarily. Well, just to say, the difference between the Iranian program and what we looked at in Iraq and uh, in, in, in Syria is the, is the scope of, uh, and the complexity of the program. Uh, what, what you had in Iraq and in Syria, you had a plutonium-based uh, uh, program, which means that you had a nuclear reactor, and that reactor could have been taken out uh, beforehand. Uh, but what you have with Iran is you have an enrichment uh, 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 program, which is uh, very wide. You have capabilities that are also plutogenic uh, because they have active reactors. They have uh, heavy water reactors. So you have something that is far, far broader uh, and they have the, no the, the knowledge base of a lot of people involved in this uh, clandestinely and openly. Uh, so this is something that is on a far, far greater scale than uh, what we had in, in, in the issue of Iraq or Syria. But uh, I have to mention that we also had uh, the Libyan 
development program, which Israel didn't know about and only knew about mm -hmm. it after the fact. And, and the one that took it out was the United States. So we, that we looked at these things and we had it. Uh, Everything so, okay there, Yochai? Yeah, yeah, everything. Okay. It's my daughter trying to break in, okay. but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm staying here at my safe room. We'll continue. We'll continue. Carry on with what you were saying, the exception being the Libyan program. So so the complexity of, of those two, uh, the simplicity of those two, with regards to the complexity of what happened uh, with Iran uh, is a major factor. So you... The, you the ability to take one strike or several strikes and take out a program of such a wide scale is something that is uh, very different uh, when you look at uh, the military. And the second thing is, is Syria is uh, very near, even if you look at, at, at the place that we had to go when we had to fly near Turkey and stuff. Mm -hmm. And Iraq is rather near. But Iran is uh, not, now you're looking at something of, uh, <clears throat> in the range of 3,000 kilometers. And that makes it far more complex. So you have complex, you have a, a, a program that is different and you have operational complexity that is different and, and far greater than we have seen before. So these two are very complicating matters uh, when you look at the, what the, a military can do uh, against these, uh, these programs. So the, the thing about that is that Prime Minister Netanyahu, Israel's immediate past Prime Minister prior to Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, has repeatedly said for many, many years, for more than a decade, that what is needed with regard to Iran are, is a combination of a biting, crippling, crashing sanctions regime coupled with a credible military threat. Now, given the complexities that you've just spoken about, and you've really only scratched the surface there, I know you, you of course, are able to go far, far deeper than that. But given those complexities and given the lack of direct kinetic, if I can phrase it like that, or military action against Iran's nuclear capabilities, has been some kinetic activity, but not military activity, if I can classify it that way. I actually have come to the opinion that there is no credible military threat against Iran, certainly not one that the state of Israel can carry out. Am I right or am I wrong in your assessment? It's, um, I would say this is a bit more complex than, than, than looking at because what is the strategic problem that we're looking at uh, when we look at the, the issue of the Iranian nuclear program? You have to convince a nation uh, not to pursue nuclear weapons when they have probably now the capabilities and, and the know-how to get there. Mm -hmm. So you have to make them, you, ha you have to uh, uh, affect their calculus of how they think about going and where they need to stop because there is still a way to go between the, the right team right now when the potential is there. They have the knowledge, they have the capabilities, they know how to enrich to a high level but it's still a race. So the question is, what happens to them during that, the decision to go there? So you have to affect the decision-making of the Iranian uh, uh, leadership, of the Iranian uh, uh, scientists themselves, or the Iranian, of, of those who make the work themselves and, and say, wait, we, we wanna take that risk. We can take that risk and go uh, that way. So you have to look at the, at, at the costs that they have if they get there and during that, and and the last and the second question is whether someone is going to trip them, whether someone is going to hit them, smack them on the head, and make them go back. Because as I said, the the problem is they have the capabilities, they have the know how, they know how to do it. If they if they're left for their own devices, they will get there. But that's the question, and that's the issue. How do you make them understand that they will not be left to their own devices? I would say like the roadrunner and, and, and the coyote, that every time the coyote is going to try and, 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 and do something, the roadrunner, it'll backfire. That's the thing. You, you, have to make, you have to frustrate them into understanding that this is not going to work. It will, it'll be frustrating by costs and will be frustrating by someone 
maybe Israel, maybe someone else, denying them the ability to go forward. And, may, and every time they try to go forward, get, uh, get them back. It may involve a military strike or military strikes. And it may involve uh, other clandestine operations that we have seen nations do to Iran and things exploding in the middle of the night uh, with regards to uh, nuclear installations and whatnot. Well, an another distinction about this particular ambition to reach nuclear weapons capability is just the, the sheer cost of a retaliation from Iran, most notably, they're not exclusively confined to by way of their proxies. I'm referring here to Hezbollah and I'm, of course, referring to Hamas, with Hezbollah being higher on the list of uh, faithful proxies, if I can put it like that, than, than Hamas. Uh, we didn't face that threat when Begin decided to attack Osirak. We did not face that threat when Olma decided to attack the Syrian nuclear reactor. But we did interview General Eli Shkedi some time ago for the US Air Force Academy on this very webinar. And he was at the time the commander of the Israeli Air Force. And he said that the preparation for a retaliation by the Syrians against Israel after he personally oversaw the detonation of that nuclear reactor was no less of a priority than preparing for the actual strike itself. Now, the reality of the matter is that Hezbollah is a more potent, more dangerous force, arguably, uh, than anything that might come in retaliation against, uh, in retaliation to a strike against Syria's nuclear reactor. How ready is the state of Israel to face down the prospect of a multi-front retaliation in the event that we strike Iran's nuclear weapons program? It's a great question. And uh, I would uh, say that there are different opinions of, on how Israel is ready. There are those that say that Israel is not ready and Hezbollah will rain death and, and Iranians will, will rain death on Israel. And, uh, and uh, from Syria, they will attack us and, and from Iraq. And, this, and, 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 we have, and we will see a war that we have never seen before. There is this school of thought. It, uh, uh, Major General Brick is, is one of those that, mm -hmm. that, is, that is saying these kinds of things uh, very loudly and very forcefully. Uh, there are others that say, we are ready. The, the IDF is, is ready. They know how to fight Lebanon. They know in, in Lebanon, they know how to fight Hezbollah. We have probably the best uh, uh, ballistic missile defense capabilities in the world right now to defend uh, the people of Israel. Yeah, war is not uh, a cakewalk. War is not nice. There will be casualties. But uh, if Israel needs to take an action to defend itself against something uh, as threatening as an, as an Iranian uh, nuclear program that might go into a nuclear weapon, then that's a cost that we have to make, that we have to uh, take. And uh, the other side would um, face the IDF, and I don't know which one, and I certainly know, I would say, which one will, will face uh, a far, more, far greater punishment uh, uh, in, in that scenario. So the question, so the question of cost is 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 inherent in, in into the strategic thinking about it. So will Israel go right now with COVID, with all of this thing? Well, are we are we going to go to war? We understand that war is is is, is a cost of doing something to the Iranians, and, and the question is, what is that something that will trigger war, or uh, will the Iranians and Hezbollah? Um, think and, and, and uh, be somewhat deterred of going uh, all in uh, on, on this scenario because they also have a lot to lose from escalating, um, especially if, if, if uh, the United States gets involved uh, with Iran, if Iran does something to Bahrain or the UAE or to Qatar where, where the U.S. forces are stationed. So the question is what the Iranians are going to do is, 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 a, is, a, is a complexity uh, on its own. Uh, but I, for one, do not think that the Iranians are going to provoke the Americans. I think that will be suicidal. And uh, Hezbollah will have to think very long and very hard uh, will, it, uh, will they go 
uh, on a suicidal mission uh, against Israel, uh, or will they try to retaliate in a more co controlled or a more specific manner? And uh, because they have their own problems, Lebanon, we don't know. It's, it's a question, and, and, and there is a, a very big uh, uh, um, wide space scenarios that, that uh, can involve. Uh, but the specter of multi-front war is definitely there in Israel, needs to take that and is taking it uh, probably uh, when they're planning for such a, an eventuality of, of an attack on Iran. So I might come back to Iran's proxies on the borders with the state of Israel if, if we have time. For now, uh, I, I'd like to ask a couple of, a couple of questions focusing strictly on Iran based on what you said earlier. You said you have to induce the Iranians to understanding that it's not in their interests right now to pursue a nuclear weapon, which of course implies that you will also have to convince the Iranians that it's never going to be in their interest longer term to pursue nuclear weapons. Tell us how, in your assessment, the Iranians can be convinced in the near term not to do so, and how might they be convinced in the more distant term not to do so? And tell us the number of years that you apply when using terms like near term and distant term or long term. A, I don't know. It's a, a, you, you have to, it, it will be, you will know it when it happens. Because as I said, the Iranians have the capabilities, they have the tenacity, they have paid a, a very large price to stay, to, to, to develop their programs in spite of American sanctions, American pressure, Israeli actions uh, in, in their uh, vicinity or even in, in Iran itself. So they have proven that they are very uh, uh, willing to pay the price for, for, for advancing that program. So how do you affect someone that is... Uh, with that mindset, one is uh, costs. What are the costs of going through, through the motion to get there? The question is, and then the costs of A, that's, that's A, costs. B is the question is, will they get there? You, you, when Iran, the Iranians understand that the Israelis have a very good, very good intelligence on what happened in Iran and have shown that they can reach out and touch as I said, the Iranians or, or specific Iranians that are involved in, in, in the nuclear program. So the question is, if, if, if they take that decision and go forward, will someone snatch them back and, 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 and yank the, uh, the floor be beneath them? So it's a question of how long will it take? So if, the, if that, is that a cost that you're willing to take for a year, for two years, for five years, for 10 years? Or... Maybe Iran will be willing to settle for the, the, this um, waiting game for, 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 for that uh, is what we call uh, a frontier, uh, uh, a state of, uh, that, that, that uh, is on the verge of uh, nuclear weapon capabilities. Threshold, and, a threshold capability. Yeah, threshold, threshold state. Uh, thank you for, the, for that. And uh, will it be willing to stay there? and uh, not incur the costs of trying to go uh, above uh, and score a touchdown. Um, this, is, uh, this is, of course, not, not a science. It's an art. You, you, you never know. You, you have to deal with people. It, it's a question of, of how the current leader is, is thinking about it, how the, the next leader is going to think about it because... Uh, he may not be there forever. And how uh, are the people that uh, the, who are in charge of the economics of Iran uh, have to deal with it? Whether Iran has the, the economic capabilities to sustain? Uh, uh, and, and what will happen to Iran if they succeed? Will it make them more secure? Or will they trigger uh, the, the Middle Eastern uh, um, uh, arms race that would uh, see Iran, uh, the Shia nation, uh, which, which have the, the historical background of, of, of Shias that have been persecuted by Sunnis for, 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 for centuries, 
now now forcing Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and, and Turkey, and 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 other nations to have nuclear weapons aimed at them. I'm not. Uh, so the question is uh, whether uh, the Iranians will live up to those plans that we know they had uh, or, or still have. Uh, that's the nuclear archive. So that they were willing to go th to that that distance. Will current uh, the current situation and the current understanding uh, make them think differently? Will they want to be a pariah state? Will the Chinese have their back? Will the Russians have their back? Who's going to buy their oil in that situation? These are very tough questions. And um, you have to make the Iranians understand that it would be in their better interests to not go and try and find out the answers to those questions. None of those considerations have thus far, thus far been sufficiently sufficiently uh, powerful and potent to bring the Iranians to draw, draw back from and move away from the nuclear uh, weapons program. Now, they may be hovering at a certain state along the development <clears throat> of that, but it, it should be mentioned that none of those deterrents have thus far been effective. Now, a couple of years ago in 2019, uh, under the um, umbrella of the Miriam Institute, I hosted Mike Morell, who was the former acting director of the CIA, in a conversation on Capitol Hill with Yaakov Perry, who is the former head of the Israeli Shin Bet, and then went on to be Minister of Science and Technology. In 2019, Yaakov Perry said he believes that Iran will, will acquire nuclear weapons capability within five years. I listened to a briefing just last week presented by uh, Mike Morell, and Mike Morell said that he is of the opinion that the world will have to look at a nuclear-capable Iran. Now, those are the viewpoints of two experts. I happen to be in that camp, but we're here to talk about Israel's potential reaction to movements with the Iranians and their nuclear weapons program. So tell us what assets Israel has at her disposal if it comes to the point whereby she decides to move militarily against Iran's nuclear capabilities and start, if you would, I think, with the Air Force. I'm, I'm just going to try and, and, and uh, rebut a little of, 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 of Please, yeah. what you said, of what you said earlier. Do. There is a school of thought that says, look, Iran has been on the verge of going nuclear for 30 years now. If, if, if you go to the, the, the intelligence assessment of the 90s, you will say that Iran is got in, in five years, in six years, and every time Iran is going forward, but not enough. So the question is, maybe the Iranians themselves are jittery about going full Monty on this. I don't know, and, 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 but there is a school of thought that says, yeah, we know that the Iranians are, are persevering on this issue, but even as they persevere, they're not going as fast as they could, could be or could have been for the large part of two decades. So something is working and maybe, and if we delay, as I said, if, if we delay this for another 10 or 20 years, I don't know, in 20 years, when the world is uh, like uh, half degree hotter and, and oil is not, is not a commodity that you wanna buy, well, maybe the Iranians will have to think of what they're trying to do and where they're gonna uh, uh, integrate themselves into that world. Uh, so, the question of delaying something is of extreme importance when you look into the calculus of states and Iran and, and, and affecting the calculus of Iran is the way forward. Now, as, as, as I have said, I, I, I'm, I think the Iranians have the capability, they have the know-how and they have the perseverance. But the question is when they are gonna have the decision, when they're gonna have that question, when they're gonna have that uh, are we going for uh, 
for a weapon, we, how do we weaponize it? How do we do it? Because on the other side, there is a very, very tenacious enemy in, in Israel. And there is the United States that is the guarantor still of the, the nation states of the Middle East. And uh, it's, it, it, they're going to have a very, very uh, a tough decision to make on, on whether and how they're going to get forward. So just saying about that. So what is Israel... Just before you answer that, I, just, just before you answer, just before you move on to answer my earlier question, and this is something I so enjoy with you, Yochai, is that we, we, we from time to time disagree. My view, my view is that were Israel in possession of the capability to militarily strike with an effective outcome, just as the Iranians have not yet made the decision to break out, I believe that the state of Israel has not made a military strike because, unfortunately, we lack the capability to do so with an effective outcome. Am I wrong? I mean, we've been talking about this for decades as well. Um, I would, I would say, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm a strategy guy. The question mm -hmm. is you don't use force unless you get the results of using right. force that you want. So the right. question is whether using force, maybe Israel had the great capabilities in 2012, but what would have happened in 2012 by sh shattering the, 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 the international uh, front that, it, that, that was cornering the Iranians by using force at that time? So the question is how, not, not if you have the capabilities to harm someone, but what is that uh, if you go to the close of it, uh, it we said that uh, the use of force is is, uh, is diplomacy and, and, and other means. I'm not sure that I'm saying it right. Uh, yeah, 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 military yeah. force. State, is statecraft in, 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 yeah. in another means. Yeah. So yeah. you have to think about it as statecraft. What do you want to get out of it? And the question is so if you delay the program uh, you know, two years, five years, 10 years, yeah. I don't know what, what would be the, the outcome. I'm, I'm pretty sure that if it was 10 years, it would have happened uh, by now. But uh, um, what would it do? Would, would the Iranians now have uh, uh, the sympathies of the world and have, uh, and have their uh, restrictions on, on, on their ability to sell oil lifted? So that's the issue. The, the, the issue is what does the military uh, strike uh, serve? And as I said, Israel prefers because the question is how do you how do you long term affect the calculus of Iran so you may have a strike that 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 in the near terms delay it but then shatters the ability to affect the calculus on the long term and that would be a, a net loss that will be a, a pyrrhic win uh, for Israel and 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 this is something that 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 will be definitely don't want to have uh, if you're an Israeli decision maker so that's it. So what 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 Israel brings to the table uh, on this issue? So um, first and foremost, we, you you this is something that will be uh, on the air force, and the air force on 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 these issues uh, we're looking at um, F-15s that uh, can make the trip to Iran. Uh, Israel have significant uh, F-16s, but the question is how and are they going to make it to Iran? And uh, and uh, and the F-35 uh, aircrafts can bring a lot of uh, um, heavy firepower to uh, to those uh, areas that, that need uh, attention uh, in Iran. Because as I said, this is a widespread program, so you have to you have a lot of targets. Uh, if if you're going to strike something, or will you go on a specific target? As I said, if, if Israel finds out that a clandestine uh, Iranian uh, sneak out, what we call, is going on, and we need to take just that particular uh, 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 leg out of, pull that specific leg out of the, out of the, under the Iranians, then it might be a narrow uh, uh, attack uh, on, specifically on that uh, uh, on that place, uh, it would have to take intelligence and uh, it would go on, on aerial capabilities that will probably be there by the F-15s, F-16s and, uh, and the F-35s with uh, probably they would have to have a long range refueling 
because most of them cannot make the way back and forth. Uh, second thing is you, uh, the, Isra the Israeli Air Force uh, brings to the tables is uh, uh, the vast capabilities of UAVs. So uh, you can have uh, um, uh, large scale UAVs that uh, can uh, um, probably drop bombs, provide intel, uh, provide cover, uh, electric, I, I don't know, maybe it, uh, it can be uh, electronic warfare. UAVs can be, can be a multidimensional uh, asset that, that can be uh, laid into the field. Uh, and uh, um, along the, UA the UAVs, which can have long range and, and long uh, and time, you, you can use uh, drones, uh, which are a more tactical weapon, but they can still, uh, but, but they can still uh, affect uh, what is happening uh, uh, in a specific region. So you can have a lot of drones, drone swarm, or, or like the Iranians are attacking uh, <clears throat> the, U the UAE or Saudi Arabia with drones. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that could happen. Uh, uh, and uh, loitering munitions. Israel can have the has the capabilities to launch weapons, and those weapons are sticking around uh, a, a specific areas. Those may be uh, used against. I, I would say <laughs> we haven't talked about the operational thing, but but when you go into such a thing, you have to look at what you want to affect, what is the target, how are you going to get to that target, how do you deal with, with the things that you might come across your way and, and, and uh, on the way to the target and try to disrupt it. So part of these things may be used against the Iranians, uh, the Iranian forces, uh, uh, the, <clears throat> their ballistic missile defenses, or, uh, their, or their capabilities to attack Israel itself. So a lot of things can work. And the question is, what is Israel trying to get out of it? Because if you think that the Iran is going to launch missiles at Israel, you might put something in the air that will attack those capabilities as they uh, launch or as they try to uh, uh, get to their uh, launching pad. But as I said, th this is uh, it, it going to hypotheticals on, on what is going to happen. Israel also has surface-to-surface -surface missiles and rockets, which are probably more short range. So they will be, have to be uh, launched from, from areas that are nearer to Iran. So Israel will have to go deploy them in, in, in an area that is, that is uh, far nearer to Iran and then launch them from that area. But that is also a, a, a capability that is, that, that is in the Israeli arsenal. Where can Israel take them that people won't know and then launch them from there? That, that's, a diff that's a different uh, a set of, of, of questions. But uh, but that is also a relevant capabilities. Um, there's also the, the Israeli Navy. I, I don't think it, it will be that relevant. Uh, the surface ships, for sure, because they will mostly be a target for the Iranian retaliation. But submarines that can provide uh, intelligence, that can maybe do something, I don't know. I'm not. But uh, submarines can get close. Yeah. And uh, we don't know uh, what what uh, the, the issue of, uh, of what the targets are, so the Navy can be there too. Uh, cyber ops is another thing that Israel is bringing to the table, um, disrupting the enemy capability to, to defend itself, to understand what is going on, uh, their defense, their air, their air defenses, uh, preoccupying them with something else, uh, spoofing them. There are a lot of things that you can do with, with, with cyber, and uh, Israel has shown that it has vast capabilities in that thing. I would, I would think that if Israel is going to do something uh, in Iran militarily, it would probably be uh, accompanied by uh, cyber ops. Um, now, another thing that Israel might do if it chooses a strike or, if it, or as an alternative to the strike is use uh, special operation capabilities, um, such special as special forces uh, capabilities. Yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what what we call uh, uh, both with the military and Mossad have shown that they have 
the, cap the Mossad has shown that they have a capability to operate in Iran and, and the military have special, op special ops capabilities. So if something were to happen, and uh, this is also something that Israel might take uh, into consideration, as I said, the question is, what is the target? How near it is? How will you get there? And so the question is, how do you use special ops in that issue? I don't, I don't know, but it is still something that Israel has and uh, might, uh, might do. And intelligence would have to be a major factor he, here. You have to know what the enemy is capable of, what they have, what are the targets that you want to want to take out and uh, how far is Iran along the way. So intelligence is critical to anything that's going to happen there. And, um, and, is, and, and last and not least, <clears throat> as, you, as you have mentioned, the, the issue, the specter of multi-front war is there. So uh, a robust uh, 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 ballistic missile defense capability would probably be something that is uh, so you have to have that in order to get into an operation with uh, uh, on Iran so you can defend yourself from uh, the possible attacks that uh, are coming your way after such a, an eventuality. Well, the other thing that Israel has is now newfound partners, right? So, for example, and you, you, you've alluded to this somewhat when you talk about surface-to-surface -surface missiles and, and capabilities, but whereas in the past, Iran had its proxies right on the border of southern Lebanon and the state of Israel, Israel now has not a proxy, but a partnership with a country that's very proximate indeed to Iran and it's an open partnership and it's a public partnership. And the country I'm referring to is the UAE. What is the role of not only the UAE, but other countries, signatories to the Abraham Accords and those expected to be signatories to the Abraham Accords? What is their role as Israel weighs its options in light of Iran's continuing pursuit of nuclear weapons? Great question, great question. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm, what I'm saying here, I, I would speculate. The first thing is I would look further uh, at Bahrain uh, more than, than the UAE because Iran is threatening to destroy, to annihilate and remove from the map two, two nation states in the Middle East. One is Israel, but the second is Bahrain. The UAE is not on the target list of, of destruction of Iran uh, as, as a nation state, but Bahrain is. So the Bahrainis have much more to lose. Having said that, having said that, there is um, complicating factors here that are um, that that I would say. W would Israel try and do something um, publicly and overtly from these states that would invite retaliation? And as if you look at the, the rules of, of war, a justified retaliation by the Iranians. And that would make the, the, the Bahrainis and the, US, uh, on the Emiratis or, or, or any other nation that in, in that region uh, to take damage because of something that Israel has done. And that is not something that Israel would uh, do or, or, or take lightly when, 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 when uh, thinking about uh, doing operations in, in Iran. The second thing is those nations host a lot of Americans, a great lot of Americans. The Bahrain mm -hmm. holds uh, <clears throat> uh, CENTCOM naval capabilities. The UAE uh, have uh, Air Force capabilities and uh, uh, Qatar holds uh, um, also the, the Air Force uh, at Eludeid base. So, so the question is, as, as so the, it's not only our, our regional partners, but, but the Americans can take the, uh, the flag of, of what Israel is doing. And these two things are not something that Israel, that, that's my opinion, would mm -hmm. take lightly when it decides to do something. I would very, very, I think that the Israelis would look very, very uh, uh, hesitantly 
on trying to do something from that territory without the specific knowledge and understanding and, and commitment by that nation state to an Israeli operation from its territory and, and understanding the implications. So I would be very, very hesitant to see uh, uh, something like that, that they would be overtly a partner. Now they can be a passive uh, a partner. So allowing Israeli aircraft to pass through their airspace if that is uh, the, the way that Israeli uh, Air Force uh, thinks that is, uh, is relevant, might be a, a, a relevant thing. Um, if, but as I said, so I, this is something I think that the Israelis will be very hesitant to do on their own. If those states, however, decide that they want to make a statement with regards to Iran, and they want to show the Iranians that they are part of an Israeli uh, Emirati, Israeli Bahraini, I don't know, coalition that is dealing with them, that would be an overt coalition that is willing to act, that would be something uh, uh, amazing. Hey, that would be amazing. Uh, what that, do you mean that, by that phrase "amazing"? You mean you would you mean because, you find that because, unlikely, or do you mean that would be wonderful? It it would be amazing because it would show a level of trust between part mm -hmm. between partners that is that that <laughs> is this is NATO. This is something that even NATO members uh, often lack, and, mm -hmm. and when they think about how to how to use force or, or employ it. Look at, look at just what happened with Ukraine right yeah, now and, and how course. NATO is thinking about using force. And if these nations would are far closer to Iran and would take the brunt of Iranian retaliation, uh, uh, would, would step up and say, yes, we, we are part of this issue. We are willing to be part of that coalition would be an amazing uh, decision by these countries to be... Um, to take an overt action uh, with regards to Iranian uh, influence in that region with, with the Iranian, with the Iranian uh, nuclear program. So, so well, that, I'm sorry, off to you. Yeah, and, and the second thing is because of, of the, <clears throat> the high probability of American uh, uh, um, casualties in such an, an, an Iranian attack, uh, retaliation, uh, I would probably think that the, it would have to be with, with the United States at least knowing and then preparing itself for an Iranian retaliation. So there will not be, a, it won't be a surprise, not to the Americans, not to the region. And uh, hopefully when you do that, it will surprise the Iranian. That, would, that makes the, the whole thing uh, a lot more complicated uh, when you have to coordinate with uh, that many allies. On, on an attack that is would be pinpoint or with specific targets and would not when you wish not to have the Iranians retaliate at the at the maximum uh, capabilities and and draw the region into into a war but make them understand that if they go all out that the Israelis and others have the capabilities to uh, further escalate and further, inflict a, a damage on the Iranians. Um, so I would think that that those partners would not be a part of a military uh, attack or a military strike. They can provide intelligence, they can provide understanding, they, uh, they can they can try and then use their, their capabilities after an attack to um, deter the Iranians from doing something uh, in, in the region. I'm, I'm, I'm truly, if, if they were willing to do such a thing, I, I would think that would be an amazing, but I'm, not, uh, but I'm not sure that this would be the case. You know, these newfound partnerships hold potential, but they're also quite fickle in some ways. People don't speak about it <clears throat> regularly and often. They'd rather focus on the positive for reasons that I well understand. But as an example of the fickle nature of these normalization agreements, you know, the UAE has begun to dialogue again 
with the Iranians. I, I, I know, for example, and I'm sure our listeners will be aware, or maybe they're not aware, that when Prime Minister Bennett recently traveled over to the region, uh, the UAE had just concluded, just concluded talks with the Iranians. I would suggest that they are opening a dialogue again because they are coming to the realizations, the Emiratis, that it's likely that Iran is going to go nuclear. What do we read into the attempt to reestablish positive relations now by the UAE with Iran? Another great question. Um, but this is something that the region has known and done for decades. You can talk to enemies. Uh, this is most of these are Bedouin tribes. Uh, they, 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 they are they, they have traditions of how you do business. Uh, the the Saudis have done business with with the Iraqis even under Saddam Hussein. So they know how to speak with enemies, to deal with enemies, and and leave door opens uh, open to I, I'm not saying cooperation, but to an, a, a mutual uh, beneficial relationship. Coordination, so, if not cooperation. <clears throat> I'm I'm not sure that it's that it's coordination. They know who mm -hmm. their enemy is, but they are willing to work with them in order to prevent. Uh, far worse uh, things that are happening. Things that, as I said, if we look at the, the issue of Ukraine and, and Russia, you can understand that, that sometimes you have to work with someone that might just, uh, if, if they wake up on the wrong side of the bed in the morning, you can, you can find them amassing 100,000 troops and, uh, on, on their border. So, and, and you have to work with them because the gas to Europe is going through Ukraine. It's not going through anywhere else. There are other... other yeah, spies, but, uh, but so the, the understanding of, of, of working with someone who might be your adversary is something that is understood in many, many ways. It is not something new. It is not something that is new to the region. It is not something that is new to the world. It's the way it's the way it, it has always been. And I would say it will always will be. But having said that, the UAE know that the, the biggest threat to their national security, and the Bahraini further know, is with Iran. It is not someone else. And trying to reduce that threat by having something positive with, with the Iranians, I would not read into it like a bandwagoning with Iran just yet. So there's another potentiality here and then I'm going to come back actually to Iran's proxies along Israel's borders. The other eventuality is and then the case has been made by many people that these normalizations that Israel enjoys with the UAE with Bahrain and with others these are what are called interest-based alliances. They're not based on common ideology, common values far from it they're based on common interests and the most pressing interest common to all parties is the prospect of Iran gaining a nuclear weapons capability. If Iran does gain that capability, do you see it strengthening or diluting the Abraham Accords? What's your view on that? Wow, that is another great question that you're springing my way. I would have to say that I don't know. It, 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 it a lot depends on, on how Iran gets there. Does it get there by uh, being uh, uh, um, um, I would say mild mannered and, 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 and doing things that not provoke their neighbors or are they doing it by still attacking their neighbors by using the Houthis to regularly attack uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE? So the question is, uh, how do you get there? Now, I'm not sure. And, 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 and then how does the Iranian act and how does the UAE and the Bahraini and the Saudis and, and, and other nations uh, 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 do that? I don't have uh, an answer. Um, it depends, a lot depends on how the U.S. works. So does, do they feel that they can still be independent and work against the Iranians and, and, and push them back? 
how how will the Chinese work the areas? Will the Chinese uh, be uh, um, a stabilizing force in the region and make the Iranians understand that even if they go nuclear, they will not allow them to disrupt the region and the flow of, of energy from that region to uh, Beijing, which is uh, over half of their uh, um, energy uh, uh, is is gotten fr from the Middle East, so I'm 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 not I'm not sure uh, uh, how we get there. There are I'm, I I think that what has been done right now cannot be fully reversed. They can't you can't go back. You can't undo. You can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You the, uh, those nations who are, are have signed up to the Abraham Accord will not be able now to throw them away and say, oh, we didn't mean it. We didn't, we weren't there. They have, they have taken uh, that leap of faith and, and, and have gone uh, uh, to the other side of, of, of uh, that, uh, that proverbial river. And the question is then how do they protect themselves uh, in that eventuality? I don't see them, uh, they may dilute part of the, uh, uh, um, uh, partnerships with Israel, I think that may might be on the part of the security things, but but the economy will have now uh, then a vibrancy of its own. Uh, the 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 UAE and Israel uh, economies are very much uh, uh, com completing one another, and the Bahrainis. So if this will be and and say in five years time. It'll be very hard to undo it. It'll be if if it'll be in a year from now, and that the Iranians will, will will have a nuclear weapon, the United States will get out of the region, and China will not be a stabilizing force. Then, if things are uh, at the uh, at the very worst scenario, then they might think that they will they have no other chance. But if things are not at their worst, I think uh, it'll be a stable. The the Abraham Accords will still be stable. So Yochai, let me ask you a question. Uh, I know you're an Intel guy and Intel guys don't necessarily deal with concrete predictions, right? <clears throat> they give scenarios, not predictions. But do you think if, if you were to predict, do you think that we'll see a strike on a military strike on Iran's nuclear capabilities during a Biden administration, the current Biden administration? <sighs> Uh, I don't know. I, I'm 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 not gonna wager in on on, on that thing. Um, I think it will it will be less. I would put it at less than twenty percent. I, I would put it this way. I, I think less, less than twenty percent that we will yeah. see. Right. It's yeah, interesting you say that because because Morel, Mike Morel, who I referenced earlier, the former di acting director, would say, puts it at less than 10%. Is he wrong? Uh, well, 10 is, is less than, than 20, but uh, it, it's still... It, is is I, he over? I, I would still win. I would still win. Even if he's right, I'll still, I'll still get the <laughs> winning. So... Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I think, I think that there are a lot of, of complicating issues here. There are the question of what, what the Iranians do, what the Americans do, the political issues in Israel, because the, the question is, <clears throat> I, I would hate to be the prime minister that said that under my watch, Iran gained the nuclear weapon and I did nothing. This is, this is someone that would be remembered in infamy uh, uh, throughout uh, history. Um, so there will be political considerations here uh, as well. Of, of, and Israel is known to be a nation that err on the side of action rather than inaction. So I would say it's 20%. I'd say it, it is double the chance that Morel said. I, I'm still mm. saying with mm -hmm. mine. So, so then I, I just want to conclude with a couple of questions about the you know the deterrent capabilities that Iran has at its disposal we we alluded to this a little bit earlier in the conversation look you have repeated conflagrations with Hamas over in Gaza we've had 
Operation Cast Lead. We've had Operation Pillar of Defense. We've had Operation Protective Edge. We've had Operation Guardian of the Walls. Who knows when the next operation is going to come? But what we do know is that even as those wars, if I can put it in those terms, against Hamas become increasingly protracted, they are yet insignificant compared to what we expect to face if Hezbollah opens up a front to our north from southern Lebanon. To put that into perspective, we anticipate about 2,200 munitions launched at the State of Israel daily, including those which can hit the most far-flung corners of the Jewish state. You mentioned the air defense capabilities. Most experts express that actually Israel's air defense is likely to be overwhelmed the famed Iron Dome system is not capable of defending against such a bombardment from southern Lebanon. Of course, all of this comes at the command and want of Iran. Is it possible that Iran actually has the upper hand, that the ultimate purpose of Hezbollah, which is to keep Israel at bay, is it, is it actually possible that they have outstrategized and outthought Israel? and have brought Israel to a point of not paralysis, but limited mobility and limited potency when it comes to dealing with the Iranian nuclear program. And also, if that is the case, if it's the case, and feel free to disagree, as I know you do, feel free to do, should not Israel be considering a preemptive strike on Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. We're, up, we're operating, after all, all over the place, uh, over the skies of, of Syria. We're interdicting and impeding the land bridge that the Iranians seek to, uh, to build and to establish. Shouldn't we really now be looking at a preemptive strike against Hezbollah, defang them, and then we'll have free reign to deal with the head of the snake, namely Iran itself? Another, another great question and great scenario. So the question is, what, what do you deal with first? And, 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 and the thing is, I, I would say, if someone thinks about dealing with Hezbollah first and then dealing with Iran, it would probably, dealing with Hezbollah would be a full-fledged war. <clears throat> it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if it starts with Iran or starts with a preemptive attack. The question is, what would a preemptive attack uh, on, on Hezbollah, uh, uh, what is the, the, the delta? What, what, what would the, it, it, it provide Israel when, when, uh, when it goes uh, to war? And uh, what would it do to, as I said, military effects strategy, strategy? What would it do to Israel's capabilities to live up to its um, targets, to its goals, to its political goals, international goals, um, going up against Lebanon unprovoked uh, uh, on, 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 on a preemptive strike would probably bring about uh, a very, very nasty reactions uh, from the Russians, uh, from, the U from the US. Uh, Lebanon is already under a humanitarian uh, catastrophe right now. And because of, of, of COVID and because of, 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 uh, <clears throat> of corruption and because of what happened at, at the harbor. So going after the uh, Hezbollah on, on our own would not be conducive. And then we will have to rebuild, replenish ourselves after that war and then go after Iran. So instead of trying to deal with the problem right now when it is still probably manageable, it will take two or three years after such a war with Hezbollah. So if we're trying to go first to war with Hezbollah and then deal with Iran, then you are buying Iran a few years of trying uh, to get, uh, of, 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 of doing what, what they want with the nuclear uh, uh, program uh, when, is, when Israel is licking its wounds. So that's one. So uh, if you're sequencing it like that. So 
the preferred sequence, I would guess, is go after the Iranian program, take it out as long as you can, make it, and then suffer what 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 Hezbollah can do to you, and take them out, and 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 that will be the war that you, that you will have to to face. Take out the Iranians, and they'll deal uh, and prepare yourself to dealing with 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 Hezbollah in and and Hezbollah's retaliation. I would hate. I would really really not want to be on the side of the Lebanese when the Air Force and the, and, and, and the Israeli uh, armor, uh, armor is going uh, through there. Uh, since uh, Hezbollah has taken a uh, very careful consideration of detaching itself from the citizens, which is, it, it's not, it has embedded itself with the citizens. So Hezbollah will bring upon fire into the, the, the villages the built-up areas of, of Lebanon, it would be destruction that has, on, on another scale, that Lebanon has, has, has yet to see. And, 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 I, and I think no one in Israel thinks or wants to go into that thing. It, it, it would be very devastating. Now, Israel undoubtedly will suffer uh, uh, from such a war, as you have, as you have mentioned. But the question is, there, there, there was one guy that I really uh, appreciate. He was my commanding officer. He said, the question is with the war is whether you can get out of the bunker after everything that they've thrown at you, do it like that, take the dust off and go and, and go back to work and go back to things. So the question is, will they be able to put a lot of dust on Israel, hurt buildings or stuff like that, or will they be able to cripple Israel? Will, be, will they be able to do things that would damage Israel, Israel considerably. I would just say, in Israel's best war, best war, the Six Day War, we have we had about a thousand casualties, dead soldiers. So I would say that even if the costs of taking out the Iranian nuclear program for a couple of years for for a significant time. And they will be far, far less than than, than a thousand uh, 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 dead Israelis uh, under any estimate, because Israel has, has prepared itself for that eventuality. The, the the we know what to do when 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 they attack, and I and I would and I think that those numbers we will not see anything close to those numbers that we have seen in the past. So the question is, are the decision makers willing to take uh, that uh, those uh, chances and see that scenarios uh, brought about. I am not envious of anyone that would have to deal with such a thing. Uh, with the, with the question is how how long with will a military strike uh, take back the Iranian uh, program? What would it do to our regional allies? What would it do to our international allies? What would it bring to the capabilities to withholding Iran on a long-term basis from uh, uh, acquiring nuclear capabilities? Um, and then what would, uh, how do we transition to, to a regional war, to a war with probably with Hezbollah uh, after a, an attack on Iran? Um, that's the, that is the, the, the scenario of an attack on Iran. Um, that is why it is difficult, but um, the Jewish state was not made because of easy decisions. It is based on difficult decisions and strong leadership that tries to uh, avert disaster and, and whatever it, it, it can. And as I said, Israel is known to be action, uh, to be wrong on, on, on the side of action than to be wrong on the side of inaction. Well, Yochai, I very much appreciate it. One very last question. I said we'd go for 75 minutes, up to 75 minutes. That gives us another four minutes. Is it, is it not true that ultimately, if Israel is to strike Iran's nuclear capabilities, Israel really has to consider the harsh reality that she will have to do so alone? I, I don't think that anyone is trying to think about it rather than 
going at it alone. But the question is whether that on, on things that are uh, um, helping Israel do it, uh, uh, whether, whether other nations will be willing to supply us with intel to allow the, the Israeli intel agencies to work from their territory and get what, what we need to protect ourselves and to inflict the specific damage that is needed uh, uh, to be inflicted on, on Iranians in, in, in a case of a strike. Um, now, there are questions. Do you want to, to, to take them into consideration? Or... Uh, no, we're going to conclude now. We're going to wrap this now because we're up against our hard stop at 75 minutes. But I do want to just express a couple of things. First of all, this is quite a heavy subject and I appreciate you dealing with that subject for us. And I think it's just the beginning of an ongoing conversation. I know we have a debate, we'll be advertising that soon enough, uh, where the resolution is Israel will have to live with a nuclear Iran and you are one of the debaters. There'll be a, a total of four debaters on that resolution. So I look forward to that. I want to Don't thank tell them what, what I'm representing. Don't tell them. I won't, say, I won't say a word. I won't say a word. I want to thank our listeners, whether they're listening live or during the podcast or postcast or on TV. Thank you very much indeed for tuning into this. Of course, I want to thank Alan Langer. Alan, thank you for coordinating this. And most importantly, I want to thank Rosita Panini, co-founder of the Miriam Institute for all that she does to bring this about and make it all possible. And Yochai, I think... I think that you can leave your bunker now because I believe, based on the absence of background sounds, your daughter just might be asleep. So you can enjoy the peace and quiet of the broader apartment or house in which you live, Yochai. Thank you very much indeed. We really appreciate it. <laughs> and, and could you please thank her for her commentary? throughout the earlier part of this webinar as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I, will, I will tell her about my son will keep me awake. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> okay, great. Great. Thank you very much indeed and have a good night. And that's the end of this episode of the Miriam Institute webinar. Take care.